Hey everyone, this is Superintendent Mark and I'm just sharing with you some of my spiritual practices. They don't have to be your spiritual practices, I'm just sharing how I stay as much as possible uh, tuned and in line with Jesus Christ and making God the center of my life. So this is the last, the final, the fourth of four little segments in which um, I'm sharing uh, those things that I try to do or focus on to help keep me close to the Lord and healthy and bearing spiritual fruit. So we've talked about uh, Lexio Divina, listening to God through the living word of God, through praying through scripture. We've talked about the five finger prayer and how that can help us have a robust and um, powerful prayer life. We've talked about the idea of a rule of life and how you create um, the lattice work or the trellis upon which the vine of the fruit of the spirit can grow more consistently in your life. So on this final uh, leg of the spiritual practices journey, I just wanted to share the idea of spiritual temperaments and what that means to me. Uh, so when I engage my life with the Lord, uh, I've come to understand that there are some things that really feed my soul and help me get the experience that I am aligned with God uh, uh, much more fully than others. And what's interesting is that some of the other practices that are very spiritual, very good, uh, really set other people on fire and allow them to experience that fullness and presence of God, but not so much me and the things that draw me near to God don't necessarily draw them near to God. So what a joy uh, when I discovered that my spiritual experience and my spiritual temperaments don't have to be everybody else's, and that somebody else's spiritual experience and temperament, uh, particularly for those that I really admired, I really want to be like them, you know, but, but what they do and how they do it doesn't move me, and it's not for me, and what a liberating thing to understand that I can't be like anybody else. I can only be like the person God wired me to be, and I can only find a fullness and joy and fruitfulness when I'm doing those things that God asked me to do, not what God has asked someone else to do. And that gives me an opportunity to be much more charitable when others don't share my enthusiasm for a particular spiritual practice. Um, and also to encourage others to explore practices they may not have thought of that could be really powerful for them, but just not part of their maybe specific church tradition or the way they grew up or what they think of as spiritual. So there's all kinds of uh, thinkers and all kinds of readers that have, or writers that have talked about spiritual temperament, spiritual practices, um, and aspects like that. One of my favorites is Gary Thomas, who wrote Sacred Pathways, and his template is the one that I'm going to share. Uh, it was some time ago when uh, Bill Hybels was at the height of his leadership at Willow Creek Community Church. And he wrote a book on leadership. I love his book on leadership. Really, really good. I encourage you to read it. But in the book, he wrote one little sentence. He said, the person that's had the most influence on me as a leader and my spiritual practices is Gary Thomas and his thoughts and ideas on uh, spiritual pathways. And I thought, wow, okay, that's a, a wonderful nugget of truth. So I looked up Gary Thomas. I'm a huge Gary Thomas fan now. All of his books are outstanding. Um, but Spiritual Pathways was really helpful and really formative. So the idea of Spiritual Pathways is that there are multiple ways that we can draw near to God and, and feel God more fully in our life and be more energized uh, by our spiritual experiences. When we're engaging the spiritual pathway that best aligns with our spiritual temperament, the way we're wired, the way we're made by God. Uh, and there are several of these. There's nine, actually, says Gary Thomas. And, and just to list them out, the contemplative, the activist, the naturalist, the ascetic, the traditionalist, the caregiver, the sensate, the intellectual, the enthusiast. And as I share these, um, I'm going to put a little bit of meat to that, and then I'm going to share what mine are and how I engage those things, um, just to let you know that people can engage these things in healthy, effective ways, not to say you need to do what I do, but think about these nine spiritual pathways and and wonder about how you can apply some to your own life and be more charitable to those that don't apply the things that really move you 
but that are moved through other means. So I'm just going to ask uh, two questions aligned with uh, each of these nine pathways for you just to kind of think about. Um, and so the contemplative pathways, the pathway of being quiet and prayerful and reflection before the Lord. Uh, so if you were listening to my other videos, Lexio Divina is a form of contemplation, silent meditation before God. So as you think about that kind of a spiritual practice, are you energized by that? Or uh, do you feel um, anxious about that? Uh, does it bring you closer to God's heart? Or do you feel even further away from God, like he's not even hearing you and you're not hearing him? The contemplative pathway. How about the activist? The activist is somebody who, uh, full of the, the power of the prophetic witness of Scripture, engages justice and seeks to make the world a better place, especially when you see those things that break the heart of God. And then you take active, specific measures to try to correct those things, to allow the shalom or wholeness of God to be more of an experience for others in the world. So when you think about the activists and you think about engaging social justice, does that uh, energize you? Uh, or does that make you feel anxious, like, you know, that's not my cup of tea? Does it bring you closer to God's heart, or does that make your blood run cold? How about the naturalist? The naturalist is the person who seeks to engage God in the out of doors, uh, who perhaps might embrace the uh, Celtic spiritual tradition of thin places, the idea that you can experience the majesty of God more clearly and in some places in nature, in, in a beautiful uh, glen or a hollow or a meadow or in the shadow of a mountain or at the base of a magnificent uh, redwood tree. Uh, so as you think about that and getting out into nature, does that energize you? Is that where you experience the presence of God? Or does that make you anxious and give you a sense that, you know, I would rather do anything than spend time sitting by a boulder in a brook. Uh, does that bring you closer to the heart of God or um, cause you to feel like I, would, I just can't experience God uh, when there's a mosquito flying in my face? So the contemplative activist and naturalist pathways are three. Uh, next is the ascetic pathway. And in this regard, it's, it's engaging in uh, long, prolonged silence and fasting and doing those things which align your body, often at a point of discomfort, in order to have a spiritual breakthrough. So as you think about uh, the ascetic, um, maybe even rule-based, I shared the idea of the rule of life. That's very much an ascetic uh, practice. So as you think about that, does that energize you to have a sense of clear patterns of self-denial, or does that bring you anxiety to have a clear path with self-denial? Does that bring you close to the heart of God? Is that how you feel close to God, or do you feel less close to God when you think about self-denial, sacrifice, fasting, extended silence, ascetic practices? Uh, and then there are the traditionalists who when they sing hymns in church and engage in communion and the rituals of the church and the long heritage of the church and just are blown away by amazing stained glass windows or uh, the architecture well designed to bring the aesthetic and value of God in the physical presence and physical spaces of the holy things of God. Does that energize you uh, or does it make you anxious um, does it draw you closer to the heart of God to be in these holy spaces dedicated to God, or does it make you feel less close to God? Uh, so there's also the, the caregiver. So as a caregiver, you find that uh, you feel really close to God when you are helping another person. That's what it's all about. You know, Jesus said, uh, love, especially, or, or minister the least of these, you're ministering to him. And so when you're providing care for uh, an elderly parent or for a child, or you're going out of your way to provide aid or assistance to someone in need, that's when you feel close to God. H how about you? Does that energize you when you think about the opportunity to 
care for another, to provide aid, to serve others? Or is that, you know, provides more anxiety? That's not your cup of tea. It's not what you appreciate doing. Does that idea of giving care draw you closer to the heart of God? Or does the idea of providing care for another make you feel less close uh, to the heart of God? So we've talked about the contemplative pathway, the activist, the naturalist, the ascetic, the traditionalist, and the caregiver. There's three more. So the sensate is somebody who loves to have the full-bodied experience of the holy, uh, of the experiences of God. So, uh, for example, you can find the power of God as you're crafting in clay and your fingers are in the clay making pottery and you're experiencing through that art and that craft the beauty of God or through dance uh, where you're able to put the motion into your expression of worship and you feel the divine uh, enter into your life or allowing your uh, experience, your, your area of prayer, for example, to be aromatic with incense and perfume, the sensate, the, all the senses, taste, smell, touch, the audible hearing. Um, how about that? Is this how you experience God? And when you think about being engaged fully in, in the arts and all the senses, uh, even the culinary arts, does that energize you as drawing you near to God or, or make you feel more anxious? Like, that's not, I don't, I don't want to go there. That's not part of my experience with God. Does, does engaging a full sensual incarnated experience draw you close to the heart of God or, or it makes you even feel like God is a, a little bit separate from you. Uh, then there's the intellectual, the person who really gets on fire and feels close to God when their mind is sparked with a new idea, uh, with a new theological insight, the new truth that they can allowed to chisel away at their own ignorance and then perhaps even share it with others, the brilliance of sharing in a sanctified mind. Uh, when you think about the intellectual pursuits, does that energize you and excite you and make you feel like you're drawing near to God? Does that make you more anxious? Um, and, you know, it's not, not my cup of tea. Uh, God has enough book learning. I don't, I don't need to engage in that. Uh, so with the pursuit of the intellectual, do you feel closer to the heart of God or further away? And then finally, there's the enthusiast, uh, the person who just needs to be vibrant in expression and vibrant in, in just in a full-bodied worship experience, singing out loud for a long, long time waving hands in the air, bowing before the Lord, and allowing every aspect of enthusiastic worship and shouting hallelujah to engage us as we come before the Lord. When you think about that kind of worship and a worship experience coming into the presence of God, does that energize you? That's, that's what you look forward to. That's what you live for. Or does it create a level of anxiety? I don't want to be engaged in things that call upon emotion, that kind of emotionalism isn't for, for me. Uh, does that draw you closer to God to be vibrant and enthusiastic in your worship or less close to the heart of God? Well, look, these are all spiritual temperaments. And the fact of the matter is every single one of them is referenced in scripture. Every single one of them is something you can see in varying degrees and in different ways by all the heroes of our faith. And every single one of them, you can see when you look at the church around you and your own family members. And so, for example, the contemplative who loves that quiet sense of prayer might actually feel overwhelmed and, and like God can't be in shouting and hallelujah. Whereas if dance and shouting hallelujah is where you draw close to God, you can't even imagine just sitting quiet and contemplating a simple word from scripture and allowing that to move and touch your heart. And when that happens, we tend to be judgmental and we tend to take away from the diverse and vast array how God has designed everybody in different ways to engage the glory and vast manifest beauty of God in so many different ways. But we diminish that uh, by saying, you know, if you're really going to follow God the right way, you're going to do it in a way that moves me because 
I know I've had an experience with God, and it's through this pathway. I don't know if you've had an experience to God through a different pathway, but mine works for sure. And it does. It works for you for sure. So bless those who come to the Lord and experience God's fullness in different ways. Now, just to share with you, uh, there's different ways to think through which is uh, which are your spiritual pathways or temperaments. And some are like just one thing, they zero in. Most people can experience the power and presence of God in, to some degree in all of these ways. Um, but there's a few that really, really bless them. And for me, uh, I'm an activist, a naturalist, and an intellectual. Now, you might wonder as I share that, if you've looked at my other videos, how can I say that? Because my spiritual practices, my rule of life is an ascetic. None of the others, it, it's an ascetic practice. And my Lexio Divina prayer, that's a contemplative practice. And yet that's not what I just identified as my spiritual pathway or my temperament. That's absolutely true because part of how we can best grow is by allowing ourselves to proactively engage and be open to how God is going to use all the ways that God wants to speak to us. But if I had my druthers and I could just spend my whole life doing a few things, it would be activism, speaking up on behalf of the oppressed, entering into areas where people are systematically denied their rights to bring the prophetic message into those places to actively pursue justice, which includes uh, listening to those that are unjustly treated, lamenting with them, but also legislation and actively engaging real change in the world. That moves me, that draws me closer to God. And I feel like I'm living a life in, of, of obedience to God when I'm engaged in that way in which he's wired me, just one of the nine. Uh, and then I also, I find absolute serenity and peace before God, grandeur and awe before God, not in the church. I hate to admit it. I'm a church man. I'm a superintendent of churches. I love the church. Church is awesome. But for me, I, I feel closer to God when I'm sitting nestled within the side of a granite mountain that existed before Moses walked the face of the earth and to remember that God made this, that God is eternal and that even this rock, which feels so permanent and has been around for millions of years, is going to fade away and was God's own invention. When I come into the presence of nature and reflect upon the nature of God in the presence of his raw creation, I feel closer to God than maybe any other time, my best times of contemplative prayer actually come when I'm engaging my naturalist pathway. And then intellectual, uh, I stay, I read too much. Uh, there, there was a, a saying in scripture, I think it was uh, uh, Felix in a court of law in Rome attacking Paul. Uh, Paul, your great learning has driven you mad. Uh, well, I'm by no means a scholar or a great learner, but I just, I read all the time. I love it. I love to be challenged by new ideas. I love to, to try to plumb the depths of a concept, particularly theological, but not just theology. I read science. I read social studies. I read current events. I read psychology. I try to engage in being aware of what's happening in the world of the arts. Uh, so I try to read deeply. Um, I even read fiction. I love when my mind is challenged. That's how I roll, uh, and that's what motivates me. So I engage other spiritual practices and other spiritual pathways because these absolutely also draw me nearer to God. And by learning about different spiritual pathways, even though there's a few that I would prefer to narrowly rest in, um, and where I find my greatest energy, so I actively and proactively engage them. But I don't need prompting to proactively engage the things I like to do. What I need, and the reason I have a rule of life, and the reason I practice Lexio Divina, and the reason I have my five-finger prayer, uh, and the reason I go to church and worship in sacred spaces dedicated to God, is because all of these things are valuable, and I intentionally need to do those because, quite frankly, they aren't the things that I always very much like to do. 
But doing those things help make me a better Christian and a better person. So I have my spiritual pathways, and I hope you discover yours. I hope this has been helpful in thinking through how you can identify and engage your own spiritual pathways and to embrace them and not feel bad if your pathways are different from somebody else, some great teacher that told you this is how you need to do things in order to be a good Christian uh, poppycock. You need to do what God asks you to do in a way that God has wired you to do it in order to have your fullest expression of joy in your salvation. So learn your spiritual pathway and engage it. Thanks for uh, taking so much time to listen and explore with me uh, spiritual practices.